All right, so uh, good evening and welcome to this new webinar organized by Biomimicry Switzerland. I'm Michaela Emsch and on behalf of our association, I'm happy to welcome you. I also welcome Sonia, my colleague and uh, co-member of the association. She's handling the technical aspects and probably hiding behind the Biomimicry Switzerland logo. <laughs> so we wish to bring biomimicry, the principles and applications uh, closer to the wider public and raise awareness about this uh, fantastic lens for tackling all types of challenges. Tonight, uh, we welcome Dr. Kimberly Samaha, uh, champion of biomimicry, mainly on the East Coast of the United States, um, but also elsewhere. She will introduce herself in two seconds. But before I pass it on to her, a few housekeeping rules. So uh, Kimberly will lead us through the presentation for 15 to 20 minutes. Uh, please post your questions in, in the chat. Um, and the second part is going to be Q&A. Unmute yourself, go for it. We're not that many and interactivity is what we're going for. So Kimberly, it's time for you to take over. Uh, please Thanks, introduce Grace. yourself and uh, tell us all the good things you are doing for biomimicry in all of your programs. Thank you very much. Wonderful. Thank you. Sonia, if you want to stop your share screen, I'll be able to pull mine up. Sure. Great. Okay, well, first I'll just start with the general introduction. Um, my name is Kimberly Samaha. I have been uh, late, maybe late in the game in finding biomimicry. My background is in engineering, aerospace and electrical engineering, and I've worked 30 years in the power industry um, doing all sorts of distributed energy, I would call it, uh, very much with a focus on um, renewables. So it was nice to hear from RT that you're working on biofuels. We've done a lot of work in that. Uh, you'll see some of that today in the projects. What I was uh, said I would do with Michaela is to just give you an overview. We're preparing something we call our impact report. Oh, excuse me, I'm getting a little something there. <clears throat> and, uh, and through doing that, we've had to kind of uh, decide what impact actually means. And for us, what that meant was how did it actually impact the lives of the people that were participating with us? So we have structured our impact report around stories and their statements in terms of what it was that um, that mattered to them as they went through this. So that's what I'm going to share with you. And without further ado, let's pull that up. Um, so this actually, uh, I apologize for all the extra black space here, but this was done as a report. So we have it in, in the format of a, uh, of a report. Uh, so again, our foundation is called Born Global. And as Michaela mentioned, we have a lot of, we had a lot of our first starts uh, on the East Coast, but we are definitely an international um, organization. And uh, now, of course, with all of this stuff, there we go, there it goes. All, all of the Zoom things make it so you can't get to your buttons below. Um, so really, let me tell you a little bit about why we called this uh, webinar Regeneration in One Generation. So as I said to you, we got started a bit late with biomimicry, um, coming through a pathway, in a, a kind of an employment pathway for myself, which was very entrepreneurial. We looked at the edges of big industries, particularly the power industry, as what is it going to take to create systemic change there? And that answer requires kind of two parts. One, we have to look at ways of dismantling the structure, because as, as we've all heard about this too big to fail mantra, um, that really takes over when it comes to systemic change. It's really things get too big and too embedded, and the system keeps just trying to survive in the way that it has been set up when what is really needed is not tweaking of that system, but an actual complete reworking of it. Um, and that's not easy. So, and it also means that there's not any one group that can do that, that there really has to be a mentality from all of the players that are in there to what I call niche till it hurts. So really find your lane and then find what you're really good at and start to do it really, really well. And if all of us start to do that together, that's how we're going to create um, systemic change. And the systems that we want to work in, the, the intersections um, as they come together, are ecology, education, and entrepreneurship. And interestingly, when we first came up with our slogan, uh, we used the word employment. 
And what, again, we really realized is that this kind of, even if you don't go out and start your own company, it's the mentality of entrepreneurial skills, adaptability, resilience, critical thinking, effective communication. Uh, we really work um, as that is almost the tip of our arrow that then drives us back through what kind of programs do we put together that are really, I mean, the, the buzzword out there is eco literacy, but this is really about kind of eco warriors, you know, getting people outside that classroom and into um, experiences that will teach them how to do this. So with that said, this is kind of our overview of what we've accomplished. Um, we've been in existence since 2016, but we got a big jump start in 2020 with COVID. Um, and that really, as we all know, made us all uh, go, go. Mother Nature sent us all to our rooms. And in our rooms, we got to learn Zoom and we got to do all of these kind of things that were not otherwise possible, um, which has allowed us to really spread our wings in three short years uh, to 30 different countries in terms of uh, people that have participated with us, 42 different projects, over 340 interns in total, and being able to partner, I'm going to show you a little bit of this, with um, universities and uh, other nonprofits that have provided our students over $250,000 worth of scholarships to do these internships. So as a nonprofit, we're able to have students come and be paid to be part of um, the work that we do. The other thing that we're particularly proud of is that we have um, tipped the scales in the STEM world and we are over 70% women that are part of our program. Um, that's quite remarkable given that I come from, I sit on the board of Boston University's um, College of Engineering. And unfortunately, when I went there some million eons ago, we were barely 30% women and we're currently um, barely 30% women. So it's really uh, an issue that we um, are very proud of in terms of the fact that there's something inherent in the natural ways that biomimicry teaches um, research and development and engineering in particular that is really adapt, uh, really something that, that women seem to resonate and excel in, let's put it that way. So we've gone around um, into different majors. We started in engineering, which I will show you, and then uh, have expanded quite a bit because you can't get anything built without money. So looking at the business and economics has been our other major force. And we've had um, lots of different new initiatives, which I'm not going to get into today, but that really start to branch out into more of the social impacts and the social sciences of um, and how we communicate that. Okay, so that's kind of our overview. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk a little bit about um, kind of our strategic priorities. Uh, these priorities are um, where we've aligned ourselves, particularly with Boston University, which has been a big um, collaborator with us. And I'm going to talk to you about a couple of the projects in terms of how they fit into these goals. So one of the things that is... Um, a systemic change within education is the fact that we've gotten to a point where education is extremely siloed, it's very um, specific, and it doesn't really teach anybody how to do anything in the real world, because they come out with a degree and they know how to get an A in a test and, you know, they know how to do something in a lab, but they don't really have something that brings them together with students from other even other parts of their own university to work on things in collaborative manners. So this particular project that I'm highlighting here, this summer, we uh, thank goodness, we were able to get things to be back in person. So even though a lot of our summer interns were working together remotely, this was a trip that we did up to the Smith Center in Maine, um, where we had a group of our uh, engineers, everybody, they weren't all engineers, it was really quite a mix, go through something called the Transform Transformation Systems Thinking Conference. And that really allowed them to um, look at their work from that perspective. Um, the, this, the woman here on the end uh, of this particular picture, on uh, to your left, I guess, uh, was a mycologist. So one of our students, uh, I don't know if you can see my pointer, I guess you can. So this is J um, uh, Josh, and he was working on a project where they were using slime mold um, and, they had created a computer algorithm that mimics the way slime mold finds paths of least resistance. So he was able to, on this trip, go out into the woods uh, with a mycologist, this woman who was a mycologist, 
And he found slime mold. And we have this gorgeous picture of him holding up the leaf with the slime mold, you know, just um, lit up about the fact that there, this was not something that was just a research project on the computer screen, uh, but he actually was able to be out there uh, and understand how that worked. Um, Benjamin also highlighted here has been uh, working, he, he's a late entry MBA student. So he worked nine years uh, at a bank in, in Ghana. And he was part of this trip as well. And it was, you know, the first time he'd ever camped out in a tent and really being able to move himself into nature. Um, that's a, a wonderful picture of him and Millie outside his first tent that he got put together. And uh, I'm, I'm sharing some of this because I want to emphasize that a lot of what we're trying to do here when we talk in biomimicry about reconnect and the ethos, um, this is what this is really about. This is the lasting impression that these students get to take away. The second one that I would like to highlight with you is something called research that matters. Um, again, a lot of what happens is that we we have a lot of labs and we do a lot of stuff, especially as undergraduates, but we don't really see where those projects address real world issues. Uh, so we do a lot of things that mix things up. We'll have philosophy students and law students on these different projects. This one, Belle is talking a little bit about the fact that she came in um, as a master's level student she had an undergraduate in psychology, so she was coming in looking at material engineering. Um, Michaela, you might recall Belle and her sister Katrina were with us in, uh, in Davos. So they were able to take this. She went through three different internships with us, which is another part of how we work. Um, it's not a one and done. We're a nest or a beaver dam, I like to refer to us as. So you can come in and come out. And Belle came in um, researching a project that was about finding metrics as archetypes, and then went on to be a mentor of some of our high school students in something we called the hydrogen hive, looking at organic chemistry, and then was with us at, uh, at the World Biodiversity Forum in Davos um, presenting that work. So her ability to be able to start with something, get into energy storage, look at archetypes, all of those different parts came together in a way that she's now a, um, she's the environmental strategist for SoCal Edison in Los Angeles, which is a huge position of influence. So it just shows that, that these things result in um, a formation that is really ready for that level of employment when they come out. Um, one of the other things that we really try to do is to make sure that the team is diverse, that we really are bringing in um, perspectives that are from various and particularly like indigenous wisdom and, uh, and, and different levels of how the earth keepers of the world have really looked at things because it's so much in alignment with the way we do this as biomimics. It's, it's kind of a, a, like a, a no duh for us, but it's really important that we have um, some of the authentic voices and that we don't come in from a side. Um, so we used braiding sweetgrass for the last couple of years as a supplement to our, our overall biomimicry education. So every summer, the interns get biomimicry certification that we do with uh, Biomimicry South Africa, and we run these um, these threads. So they literally have an opportunity to read a chapter, talk about it amongst themselves in, in terms of the perspective shifts that they see, and then they actually have to apply that to their projects. So right now, the two main students that have been running this for the last couple of years are Dee and Ethan. Um, Dee is half Lakota Swift, uh, Sioux Indian, and she has um, been able to take this this summer. She actually was selected and paid for in a scholarship at MIT um, to go in and talk to a larger audience about what does it mean to incorporate indigenous thought into our work. Um, Ethan is also a terrific example of this. He's from Jamaica and he came in as a philosophy major. He was awarded a very um, coveted uh, philosophy award called the Car Bank Award uh, for his work at Born Global. And he was able to really continue to put together now something that we're gonna probably take into a a larger series for um, the public to participate in terms of using this braiding sweetgrass, a biomimicry toolkit that goes along with that. They worked in conjunction with a couple of master's students from the ASU biomimicry program to put that together. So that's another example. Um, the other part that we really try to emphasize is to create a sense of community. Uh, I think that you know one of our themes that we work on 
under the concept, if we're going to get to regeneration in one generation, we have to think in terms of biomes and not borders. And that has a lot of additional implications that go beyond finding technical solutions or business solutions. It really incorporates the ideas around um, interconnection, policy, law. Uh, so this year, we launched a few more programs in conjunction with both the, what it's at the school, it's called the party, which always sounds like they're having a party, but it's P-A-R-D-E-E. -E. Uh, and that's their global studies program there. So, in, and also something that we're kind of calling theoecology. So going for some more faith-based um, initiatives. So here we have a picture of a bunch of the faculty from Boston University um, at this Isabella Gardner Stewart Museum, where we had a day where we kind of put our heads together. So you've got Rabbi Jevin Eagle there, who's also teaching social impact MBAs and running the Halal Society, people from the business school, engineering, uh, and more importantly, bringing in some folks like Katerina Scaramelli, who's kind of a superstar uh, when it comes to um, uh, teaching human and cultural anthropology and how she applies that to natural models. So that was kind of a part of where we want to really bring people together again, you know, it's there's nothing like breaking bread together and having a nice glass of wine to be able to kind of come up with a sense of community and uh, and that's important to us. So then lastly, I think um, I'm, I have other examples, but I'm going to stop after these two. And then as we have some questions, I can pull up some of the others. Um, the, the last one is uh, why we're called Born Global in the first place, and that is about the fact that we really want global engagement. So I mentioned earlier um, about Josh coming up with this algorithm from Slime Mold. So on the bottom here, Vittoria is an international student. She's actually from Italy, and she and Josh were on the same team. They won what is called our co-opetition. Uh, and then we mat we matched them up with Alana, who is also a uh, mycologist and a master's student at ASU. And they worked this summer looking at taking that mapping algorithm and mapping out the water system in Dubai. So from a reverse osmosis system that was located in the sea, um, the question was, how would you find the paths to get to the largest amount of population um, the quickest? And uh, along with actually doing the computer mo modeling, Alana grew some slime mold using oats, where um, you put in different levels of oats that correspond to the size of the proportion of, of um, uh, population. And they were able to kind of show that there is some real truth to this, uh, this little organism of slime mold. Uh, and it was a lot of fun. So we ended up having uh, the ability to kind of have this real global environment. Alana actually now works up in Alaska and she was working with Victoria who was over in Italy. And it was a, a whole in combination. They were part of our mangrove team. And so they were looking at 12 different students from six different countries on one team. Uh, and that definitely, I think, gives them the stamp of global. Okay, so I'm going to just stop there, Michaela, for a second. I do have some other engineering projects that describe the competition and some things like that, but maybe we can just take a little minute and see if there's some things before we get into to more just talking. Thank you very much, uh, Kimberly. I, I have a few questions to start off with, but please, uh, um, other people also chime in, please. I have this very um, first thing that I wrote down is you you try to break down the silos. So breaking down the silos also uh, culturally, which you see with your diversity program, which is quite easily understood, you know, putting different um, points of view and origins and life stories into one team uh, seems quite straightforward. But what I'm wondering is how do you break down the silos and go from thinking to doing? Yeah, excellent. Um, yeah, that's excellent. And that has been a real challenge because, um, for example, one of the projects, and, and maybe I can skip forward to that one if I can on the thing and I can show you how we did that. Let's see, let's just go through these and find that one. I think it's towards the end. Oops, it keeps making, I was telling you this before, it doesn't like to go forward. It likes to keep going backwards. So we've had a challenge, obviously, because of um, this online environment. And when you do work internationally, uh, there are some issues regarding 
getting people there. So this was a, a project that we did together with um, what's called the Center for Forced Displacement. Uh, this is a project in Lebanon where um, it's a what they call the the riverless project. So it's actually a piece of land that is near a river that has been made just into concrete. It was one of the most polluted rivers in all of Lebanon. Um, and they started with getting a piece of land and working with something called the Miyawaki method. I'm not sure if you're familiar with that, but it's the idea of really densely um, planting native trees. And our team was able to um, work on this from an international perspective where we had to take a slice of what was actually happening in real action. And this group, um, this is uh, Ava, who was an international relations major, worked together with um, uh, a scholar from Cambridge that's now part of this whole kind of Oxford initiative of how do we look at stakeholder analysis. And they did their slice. So they were able to, as I kind of said again, creating that systems approach of really niching things, we were able to come in and have them go through the program this summer. And their goal, it was very interesting actually, because this whole stakeholder analysis is based on the concept of goodness. And goodness is quite a relative term. So they created word bubbles and all sorts of different things around a series of surveys that looked at various aspects of the model. Um, so these things value things both from biodiversity, economic, and even spiritual levels um, to determine how might you create a question, a questionnaire that would be valid for asking these kind of things. So if they were going to continue, this is just one little picture. Um, this is one of the plantings that we did with them last year. So our students from Lebanon were part of that planting, including myself. Um, but there's other areas, there's three plots of land there. And so now their next step was that they want to take this to all of these. You can see some of the backgrounds of the of the um, land. So you've got industrial areas, you've got a Syrian refugee camp, you've got all of these varied types of stakeholders that might be interested in this. And how might you get the right kind of involvement of those stakeholders by first asking the right questions? So that's an example of how we're trying to pull these two things together. Um, we're going to do a lot more of that next year. Our summer internships are going to be, it's going to be required that there's an in-person part. Um, but like I said, I mean, in this case, that was all scheduled. And Boston University came back and said, oh, Beirut, it's too dangerous. And so <laughs> we're not going to allow travel there. So we get crafty and we find uh, another way that we can be involved, even if it isn't going to be um, the actual hands to put the plants in the ground, we can do our part. That's fantastic. I, I, I like the way you transfer, you know, some hands can be other people's hands. <laughs> so <laughs> yeah. wherever you are, you can be the hands of somebody or the brains of exactly. somebody. So exactly. So we can exactly complement right. each other, which, which puts me to my next question. Uh, I would like you to explain a little bit more what you understand by niche until it hurts. Yeah, don't you love that? I really well, like that. You knew I'd yeah. like it. Yeah, yeah. Well, I think that that's been a lesson that's honestly been a little hard for me to learn. Uh, because, you know, you always feel like there's so much world to be a saving out there that you got to do all of this stuff. And, and as you know, we've had when you go all of this stuff, there's been a lot of stuff, you know, we've had things from sustainable perfumery to biochar to, you know, uh, down to the fourth phase of water and how it organically, chemically, hydrogen clouds, like we've got a little bit of everything. So our mission and part of the reason why we're doing this impact report is to really show um, what kind of what you just said is another analogy, like what what is instead of looking at our carbon footprint, which is basically like an accounting mechanism that's become really standard. We want to look at our handprints. So where can our one hand with our one particular expertise and niche make the pay it forward part of this happen? You know, so a lot of even with this particular project, um, the carbon credit market and all that we're seeing with that right now is still trying to account for stuff, which when we know in complex adaptive systems um, is stupid. It's not even impossible to do. It's just dumb because what you're trying to do is create forward inflection points. 
So we've done that. I'm going to let me just see if I can find maybe a, another good example of something to show you that would, would do that. OK, so this is Artemis Carbon Futures. So this is one of the business initiatives that we put together um, with the business students. And this, this particular one that you're seeing here was the MIT Sustainability Summit. Um, which was, again, a pretty prestigious uh, event that had amazing speakers coming in from all over the world, looking at very specific things. So in this grouping, instead of trying to say, how do we solve carbon? Um, this is uh, Joy Lapidus, who you know, Joy, who came in. Um, she's a MIT PhD and works with the Navy. Um, this this woman here, um, uh, gosh, she just to escape my name. Uh, she's an LCA expert. So really looking at the accounting of how things are getting done. Uh, and then, you know, some of our interns, Adarsh back here is actually, he's a, um, a nuclear submarine officer with the U.S. Army and, you know, I mean, I mean the U.S. Navy. So this incredible group um, that, as he says in his own quote, it was very atypical for an MBA student to be into something like this, which was a hands-on experience. So, you know, we're not out there building a carbon capture, but we found these very specific niches. We put them together in a class um, where we had each group had their own little piece. So one, one group was looking at this kind of LCA. Another group was looking at regen finance. So we kept, I know you're a systems thinker, Michaela, so you get this. You just keep getting them into like little smaller bubbles where you niche till it hurts. And then once they get that part really well done, we keep rolling it up. So when we were able to then, you know, there's maybe a hundred threads that need to be addressed, but we focused on uh, artificial intelligence. Does blockchain make sense? How would you data model? How do you LCA? We, we pick these little lanes. And then once we kind of were able to get real good at that, we could start the weaving and the netting at the next level. And it was just super successful. We've actually started a company, uh, an LLC that is called Artemis Carbon Futures. Uh, and so now there's actually a home for this level of consulting and Adarsh is still working with us on that as we're taking that forward now into funding in 2024. So there's an example of that one. Congratulations on Artemis. <laughs> yes, thank you. We love Artemis. We need, we need our, our, our mythologist. Oh. We need, uh, yeah, oh. we need Christina to come in on Artemis and give us some insights. <laughs> We'd love to have her on this podcast, by the way. Oh, yeah, definitely. I think Sonia has a question now. Uh, unless somebody else, please type in the in the in the chat and we'll take them one after the other. Thank you. Maybe I go first if there is not yet another one. Uh, we talked before a bit about uh, turning degrees into jobs. Could you give us an yes. example of that or dive a bit deeper? Yeah, sure. Let's see if we can find another example. So I showed you that one about um, about Belle. Uh, this is Juliet, but she's still going. She went back to Seance Po in... Um... Okay, so here's, here's two examples. So this one... Um, uh, is a, a follow on. These are both again, kind of leap students. So one of the areas in education, you know, we all, uh, anyone who's a parent on this on this call knows, you know, you're, you're dreaming for your kid to get into college. It's a big time, you know, what's the name and blah, blah, blah. And the undergraduate pieces of this are fairly well handled. Um, as you get to be a PhD, it's really well handled. You get all of this kind of stuff. The master's is a tough one. Uh, to get people to go back and actually do that level, they're mostly having to pay for those degrees themselves. And they're a lot more and more going back as, you know, not mid-career, but definitely after four or five years worth of work. So this particular program that we work very closely with is called LEAP, and it's all about creating um, uh taking people that maybe are going to end up being better societal engineers in this case because they're coming in from various backgrounds. And then um they are going to be coming out looking immediately for a job. You know, they're not just going back to enrich their knowledge. They need this to be applied learning. So these are two examples. Um, James Nilsson was with us. He came in in, uh, in 2020. He was already a, a senior. Uh, and then he went on after he kind of had an opportunity. He took his different backgrounds and it worked on narratives and um on, on what a biohub is, and he got very deep into some of the engineering of this, but he really uh, was able to kind of blend, I guess, finance and engineering. And now he is uh, has a job uh, that he's doing out 
in the world uh, working for, actually, we, we gave them the recommendation to get this, a startup company in Massachusetts that is trying to come up with um, new technologies for physical physical sites. You know, how do, how do they come up with these things that are going to be um, uh, brought into various different industrial sites to, to regenerate them? So that was a direct app. Uh, Joanna's another one. She was um, she worked on the LCA team, uh, which she'd never even heard of before she came on with us. So she was able to do that for about three semesters. She received her certifications as a practitioner, and now she's been hired as a carbon analyst at a pretty prestigious firm in California um, that's called Rincon, I think is what they're called. So those were like just a couple more examples of um, when I said, you know, the whole sphere, even though we work in those three systems, we try to have a pull mechanism so that the first idea is where, where and what kind of work, you know, I don't want to call them jobs because I hate that. Um, no one wants a job anymore. They want fulfilling work. <laughs> what kind of a work opportunity uh, is out there? And then how do we supplement the formal structures of education to help these students get there with the intent again i mean I, i'm going to repeat our slogan i mean if we want to get to regeneration in one generation a generation is like 30 years so we stay in our niche till it hurts we stay in our lane so we really focus on you know our primary target is the undergraduates but we have very strong high school programs and then master and phd programs we're developing further mm -hmm. Very good. Um, I We have another question in the chat uh, concerning the internships. Micheli is asking if you offer internships only in the summer or all year long? Yeah. So um, we've tried all year long. We work on a trimester basis. Um, so we have fall, spring and summer are kind of the three blocks in which we work. Uh, and for the internship program, the most effective is really summer. Trying to get students to do a effective internship while handling school load has not worked out. We've tried it a couple of times, but typically what we will do is they will have an intense um, uh, time with us uh, during the summer, and then they go back to school. And I'm going to show you one other thing that we do during the school year. So during the school year, we do things that we call coopetitions. And so then typically what this is, we've run these now at Boston University. This is our fifth year doing it. Uh, and we do it in conjunction with the Institute for Sustainable Energy. So a lot of the projects originally were focused on energy solutions and now they're much broader. Uh, but in essence, what we do is we, uh, there's, there's rules to this. You have to be an interdisciplinary team. It has to be a sustainability challenge of some sort. Um, the biomimicry is non-negotiable. They all learn biomimicry in terms of its phases and the applications of that, from which we mentor and guide them. Uh, so we have different kind of webinars like this and different experts that come in to help the teams. Uh, maybe most important, and it seems like a little extra there, is the concept of the iterative design process. So really teaching them even during the year that you don't just, it's not a sprint. You don't run and then somebody gets across the finish line and you, you know, everyone wins or that person wins. Um, that it's really about how we learn to cycle and continuously go back as biomimics. We always cross that bridge and ask nature. And then once we really learn the true strategies and not our, our man-made applied strategies from nature, we come back and we apply those to um, our solution sets, which are typically, you know, um, human problems. But that's not it. You've got to keep going back. So every time you go and you iterate and say, okay, now we've solved this piece, slime mold does this, but we need another organism that shows us how to pump that water from the sea to the place. So let's go back. Let's go back over the bridge. So it's teaching this kind of um, mentality that then during the school year, uh, when they come in as interns in the summer, they already kind of have the, the, the groove, so to speak. And that way we can really start to focus on that last piece. Uh, when we run these competitions, most of the top three winners are offered internships during the summer and gets us to that point where now we've evaluated it through their effectiveness and how can we start to help them scale it, either by coming up with prototypes, simulations, or like in the case of that one I just showed you, um, they'll go, they're gonna work on a little piece of an actual project that's out there in the world that needs help. So mm -hmm. that's how we do that. Yeah. There is a question about the applications. 
when do the internet internship applications for summer 2024 open up and how can you apply for these internships? Great. So that's a great question. And uh, that's a real practical question. So we will open up the internships in January, typically towards the end of January. Um, we operate on something that all the students are familiar with now. It's a platform called Handshake, um, which we love because we just talked about that we want handprints and not footprints. <laughs> so that was just a good coincidence is that's what it's called. And it's pretty global now, but I know it's extremely well. Um, uh, I mean, every student in the U.S. knows it. And so you can go in and, um, you know, you put in your different areas. There's all sorts of tags in which you can search for stuff. Obviously, you can just search under Born Global Foundation. Um, and then that will get you to our application portal and you can apply. Um, we will be announcing what the internships are for next summer. Obviously, there'll be some that are going to be in all of those categories. And we are going to be definitely taking forward a little bit more of what we've been calling um, migration is hospitality. So getting a little bit more into that realm of um, how that works. The one project that isn't listed on this one, which is an important one, is we have a gamification uh, project called the Alchemist Garden. And that one is really um, quite wonderful. It's uh, about creating a little character named Merlene. She's a modern day biomimic uh, that hails from the great traditions of the Druids and, uh, and the great Merlin. And she uh, has gone to find her book of life. And when she gets to the hut, there's no mentor, there's no Merlin. So she has to go out as a young woman on a heroine's adventure and travel to these different biomes and learn from nature. And uh, I don't know, Michaela, I didn't don't know if you've been following Yolanda, but we were just awarded the uh, Royal um, Society of Arts, the very famous uh, foundation in Great Britain uh, has awarded our team in South Africa a grant to go ahead with this. So we're bringing in our second cohort of um, particularly, we're very focused on uh, bringing an opportunity to women of color in South Africa that are animators, again, niching till it hurts. Um, that is a really underrepresented uh, segment there that doesn't really get an opportunity for any kind of work. So they're going, we did the first cohort we had was 12 students, and now we're going to have 20 uh, young women go through this program. So it's really exciting to see how that stuff starts to blossom and grow. Once we get them, once we get the right group of brilliant minds together, these kids just, they just said the sky's the limit, which is what makes this work so rewarding. That's so great. Mm -hmm. um, can you join only as a student or can you join uh, also mid-career? Yeah, well, that's a great question. So that's another thing that we're really working on. Um, you know, I talked about these LEAP programs. So some of our students have been in their 30s and 40s, uh, but they typically have been associated with a university. So that's part of the programmatic uh, redirection that we're looking at for the fall. Uh, you know, we may want to do something, excuse me, as simple as uh, offering the braiding sweetgrass as a, you know, a supplement to uh, you know, I, I, I don't I don't even want to use the word book club because it's so much more than that what we did, but a grouping that would want to kind of touch in and make sure that they're connected with the ethos of what it is that they're doing. So there's an opportunity there that we're looking at. Um, and we're starting something else. Uh, we we participated with Fritjof Capra this summer. I was delighted to know he was even still alive. He's been my <laughs> hero forever. And the Tao of physics and kind of more the uh, the the where he's integrated systems thinking to um, philosophy and religion and organizations. And he's just absolutely brilliant. I feel like, unfortunately, we never really appreciate these minds until after they've passed. But he, it was like having Einstein on the phone with us. And we took 250 students, um, some of which were mid-career mentors. We just opened up the doors. Um, we as a foundation uh, funded and supported this. And they were given a certificate from Capra going through this. It was a 12-week course. Um, so that kind of thing, we're really thinking about opening up to uh, professionals. You know, in that one, we had people from all walks of life. Uh, we had a whole grouping of international students that were part of the Holt Prize that were working on things like, um, you know, greeting better silkworms in Ethiopia to, you know, to have people that were doing uh, biochar, it was all over the place. So that's something now that we're calling the Living Systems Fellowship, and we're looking at putting that together into a more formal offering. Uh, that will probably be offered in June and July of next year. So stay tuned for that one. Mm -hmm. 
Where can if we there is not another question, I would have one last question for you, and then <laughs> you go, Michaela. Um, go it sounds like um like a big family. I have a yes. culture question. Um, do the students, uh, which spend so much time and so much hard felt uh, experiences together, do they stay together as a as a group, as a family, as a community, like an alumni? I love that, I love that question because I think. Uh... Okay, so this one is Juliet, uh, and that was funny. And I'm really, really, really happy that you asked that question because when she sent me this, she said, you know, is this quote okay? Because I really want to talk about the friendships that I made and a little bit less about, uh, you know, the the internship that I had. So that was that was her quote, you know, the connections that I made through, the, through Born Global went beyond Zoom screens and LinkedIn connections and became true and lasting friendships. So yeah, I, I, that's one of my biggest joys is that that's really happening. Um, Juliette went on now, she's over at Sciences Po, she's a master's, I mean, that's a very prestigious school in France, as you both know, um, and she's gone into, she she was doing undergraduate international relations and her experience with another, this is a company that we put together, it was a consulting uh, type of a class where they could consult as uh, two companies, and this is another company we're forming called Athena Power Holdings, and that was really what she did, she ended up kind of finding um, you know, not only that her work connected parts of her studies uh, that seemed really distant to her at the time, like how does international relationships, business and environmental science come together into something, but she really felt connected to colleagues and mentors and friends from across the globe. So that's part of now, um, uh, you know, now that we've, we've really only been this intense, to be honest with you, for the last three years, but our community has grown very quickly. Um, so next week, I'm up in Boston and at BU, and they're doing a picnic at the beach, and all the Born Globals are coming, and, you know, it's fun. They're starting to actually refer to themselves as Born Globals, so it's becoming a tribe that is starting to have its own identity. So I love that, and thank you for asking that question. Mm -hmm. Thanks for answering. Michaela? Yeah, I was, I was wondering about your... Um holistic approach and the Capra course and as well braiding sweetgrass and um, taking into account what you call earth keepers or custodians or whatever uh, we, we can call them, uh, working with indigeneity and also international and biomes, not borders. I'm always thinking of what's his name again. He's, he's coming on our webinar in December. Um, Leon. Stefano. Ah, so Leon, okay. Leon always mm. talks about biomes, not borders. Um, so I can see a lot of tension between the niche until it hurts and and, and all this expansion. Uh, and I would like to know how you as an organization handle the nitty gritty and the very broad and the holistic approach uh, while making an impact on a acupuncture point. <laughs> I love it. Great. Well, I'm going to go straight to one of our LPs, our life's principles, Michaela, which is to build in uh, nested and module components. So we operate everything. We kind of taking, you know, taking from, from Capra's course, everything has to have a membrane. So the importance of actually creating what is inside a niche and what is not is extremely important. So part of what we do when we start any of these, we walk through the four parts of biomimicry, which starts with scoping. So that first phase in scoping, um, we take who's there, their specialties, we create what is going to happen within that time period and what is not. So that's why as these things build up over time, um, you may have a group, for example, that worked on biochar. So the first time we did that, we had three different groups looking at fertilizers, um, filters, and uh, animal feed. And then from that, those very specific niches, we rolled that up and combined it with some business uh, students that then said, well, you know, there's going to be these problems if you do animal feed, and probably filtration is your path of least resistance because there's a market for that. So then we niche it again. And we say, all right, now we're going to open up a next internship that's going to focus on biochar as filters. And then that requires that we need another specialty group, for example, in recirculating aquaculture, because we're going to try to look at putting these filters into that emerging market. So we niche it again, you know, but now you've got two groups that are working on the same problem set. And then it gets 
kicked up again, again from there, that exact example was that they said, well, actually in recirculating aquaculture, the key problem is not the filters, it's the feed. And we go, oh, well, guess what? <laughs> we were looking at, at the idea of feed from this from the beginning. So now maybe that storyline becomes relevant again and gets rewoven into that. What we actually found on that particular journey was that we found a microorganism that can eat CO2 and basically poop out protein. Uh, and there's a group called Kyverdi that's being run by, she was a woman um, scientist from NASA who was able to figure this out. Uh, and so then we, the third level of this, we tied it into a bigger picture that said, okay, what if we close that loop again? You know, So what if we take biochar and we make filters for recirculating aquaculture from a distressed power plant that's spewing out CO2 and we use that CO2 to create the food and we actually found out that we could create um, dried ice from the CO2. So now you're able to kind of grow shrimp or salmon and you can package them in your CO2 dry ice and you can feed them from your CO2 uh, uh, food. So the whole thing starts to become then what we call a biohub. So that becomes the macro. So we kind of take, it depends. We do it almost the same way that biomimicry does. Sometimes we look at a macro issue and then say, all right, what parts of that do we want to break down? But more often than not, we'll get onto something like biochar and start to say, okay, let's look at that from various small pieces and allow the thing to kind of organically grow based on, you know, who's who's sitting at the table that semester. If there's somebody that's an expert in recirculating aquaculture, we may go that direction and uh, and if there's other people, we, you know, we may take it. There's so much to do, I guess. Let me summarize this by saying there's so much to do that that niche till you're hurt gets you to stay guided into a direction that actually becomes something real and not just a theoretical, well, oh, wasn't that cute that we used, you know, shark skin to pretend we could build a submarine. <laughs> that, that one's probably not going to happen. You know, there's going to be a few barriers on that one. So stay practical, I guess, is the key. I can see Artie. I'm sure you have a question. Well, well, it's. I think what this is doing is just sort of provoking thoughts around my head. I don't actually. I have more. I don't know if it's a question or a. Um, yeah, I guess it is a question, right? So what what we are doing um, is uh, we use, we're looking to rebuild soils through um, enhanced weathering, so crushed rocks because we have a lot of um, shallow basalt um, in this part of the world because of the volcanic activity. So we want to take um, sort of mining waste, and in Kenya it's predominantly quarry mining as opposed to metallurgical. Mm -hmm. Take that, uh, put that together with biochar um, and soil organic matter and, and start rebuilding soils because the soils here are degraded now i guess my question is where can i find some biomimicry to go in all of this because i don't right now you know that um I'd, I'd love to find something um and i guess if i were to take a step back and say what what is it we're trying to do you know the, we're trying to solve multiple problems uh food security um nutritional security um mining waste disposal um rebuilding soils, removing, reducing, and avoiding greenhouse gas emissions. So yeah. yeah, I guess I'm just throwing it out there. Yeah, I mean that's I mean that's beautiful because it just gives us an example as to how we would work. So you know you're in Kenya and those are your concerns. So we have a wonderful uh person that we're connected with in Kenya, Enoch. Uh and he has been very concerned about the rivers and we've already put together a proposal with him for an internship. Um, he's part of the Maasai uh, tribe, and so he's also got a lot of, um, uh, I guess, 
a, a, a different wisdom in terms of how they even view the rivers as kin. And uh, so that was, you know, that's an example where you kind of raise your hand and you say, we're doing this. And the other part that we've been tying together is exactly uh, biochar for capping orphaned oil wells, as well as mines, um, because of the, uh, the issues about brackish water and the salinization that happens in, in both of those cases. So it's not really clear because in order to do what you're talking about in terms of regeneration of the soil, that's hard to do with salt water. So um, we have this group that's working on desalinization biochar so as you you know as you lay out your map that's kind of i guess one of the things we're going to have to get better at is to see who around the world can raise their hand and say hey you know we've got funding or we've got an idea or we've got something that we want to do and how might we come in and help to bring in a piece of that because we definitely are not in the category of solving it uh, but we are able to do it in a way that gets the local students, the local universities um, involved in action within their own backyard. So that's a great question. And, you know, love to follow up with you on that one in particular. Uh, Michaela can get you my information and, and would love to, to think about that. That was one we tried to get going last summer as well with Enoch. Um, and we, again, we just got stopped at Boston University with this global travel. It was a, basically a new guy that came in that was like, you know, you can go to Connecticut, but you can't go anywhere else. Like that's as global as we're getting this year. So hopefully that it doesn't matter because, uh, you know, the, the restriction at the time, it was just too hard to open it up to more local universities, but that's definitely, we're open for that. We will currently in Africa only are working with Stellenbach and uh, University of Cape Town because most of our focus has been in South Africa, but that's certainly um an easy thing to expand upon yeah well let's let yeah absolutely let's find a project whether it is one that we're directly involved in or i mean there is yeah masai mara university and um jacqueline mcglade who was the chief scientist at unep is associated with that and you know they're also looking well the, their perspective is different they're looking at sort of data um around sort of what's in the soils etc so i um, yeah i think let let me find a way of um, connecting some dots yeah that's what that's what we love to do that's exactly it you know connect the dots and then do a little piece i just it's always expectation management i mean we are working with young students and you know it's not it, it, there there's elements of this i mean the beauty of the biomimicry is that often the younger the student the better the result because they haven't gotten too clever in their mind yet and they're really willing to learn from the natural models in a way that as we get older it's harder to not just start applying it right away um, so that's, that's the beauty of it. But then there's also a lack of real, like, you don't come out of one of our internships with a fully budgeted, you know, plan and blah, blah, blah. The professionals still have to surround them to be able to make that next step happen. Fantastic. I will connect you with pleasure. Uh, I had a quick question, if you can just answer it in one sentence, Kimberly, before we close down. Ah, yeah, right, Michaela. When does that ever happen? <laughs> one sentence. Let's make it two because it's you. How, how can one propose a project to Born Global? If you have yeah, a well, like RT? that is a great question. So we are now part of what was my little wibble this morning is that we're putting these impact reports together now so that we can then spend all of November focusing on structuring just those kind of questions. So, I mean, you will for sure, Michaela, be part of that conversation along with the rest of our biomimicry global network. Um, I think that's where we want to start. Um, I told you my non-negotiable, I'm not doing one of these projects unless I've got a biomimicry professional on the team. Uh, because it's just, you know, they're, they're, it's too new and people can't run these things in the proper way from a biomimicry methodology perspective unless one of us is at the table. So you will, you, your question is, is self-volunteering you. Okay. <laughs> we'll spread the word then. <laughs> yes, we will. We'll get, we'll get as many of our, of our tribe together to support this new regen and one gen tribe. Fantastic. So my Austrian timekeeper is nudging the Swiss timekeeper to close the session. So <laughs> I guess I'll have to do, otherwise I'll I'll be, uh, I don't know, banned from Austria. <laughs> so uh, thanks everyone for your questions in the chat or live. Uh, thanks to Biomimicry Switzerland, especially Sonia. 
thanks Kimberly for uh, making time for us and to showing us this enthusiasming, enthusiastic, <laughs> whatever. <laughs> bringing enthusiasm to the world for biomimicry and uh, other regenerative uh, practices. And uh, if you wish to help, um, please donate to Biomimicry Switzerland. Uh, we posted the survey. Now there's no survey form, but please keep in touch if you have ideas for speakers, if you want to speak yourself, if you have questions about biomimicry, we will lead it uh, further wherever it has to go. And uh, yeah, so um, just two seconds for Sonia. You're hosting the next, next webinar in two or three weeks time. So tell us more about that, please. Yeah, just two or three sentences. It will be the 18th of October and it will be, my guest will be Susanna Tonkikova. She is um, associate professor and vice dean at the university in Svoren in Slovakia. And she will speak about nature-inspired design education and how her journey came from uh, adoption to the transformative power of um, um, biomimicry to empower students to bridge the gap between design and nature. So she will be my guest at the 18th of October. And I will be hiding behind the logo this time. So <laughs> we're taking turns. So thanks, everyone. I love Thank you. And Thank you very much. But very lovely, very lovely to see you and meet you, some new folks and new faces. Thank you so much, Michaela. Fantastic. Uh, this will be recorded. You will have it within two or three days on YouTube. So okay, great. See you Thanks next again. Month. Bye, Sonia. Bye. See you soon. Bye bye. Thanks, <laughs> bye, Micheli. Bye, Asa.